And so um, they walked the walk. They are our boots on the ground. And so we've got JJ Leibel from Santa Fe Trail Middle School, Stacy Green from Stockton Grade School, Kelly Whitaker from Ottawa High School, Ashley Kappelman from Liberal High School, Shauna Evans from Meadowlark Grade School in Liberal, Craig Idakavage from David Brewer Elementary in Leavenworth, Cody Calkins, principal at Lake and Middle School, Jill Lockenmeyer, assistant superintendent with Andover Schools, Sheila Wendling, assistant superintendent with Newton Schools, and Jen Kern, curriculum director with Wellington Schools. So thank you all for giving of your time and to help support these leaders who are new, brand new to a redesigned school or system. With that, I'm gonna turn it over to my colleague, Jay Scott. He's gonna give us a rundown for the schedule for today. Hey, thanks, Tammy. Good morning to everybody. It's great to see everybody. I wish we were in person, but this is just the times we live in. Um, so I thank you for, for virtually connecting with us today. I love the question Tammy posed to all of us. Um, I think that's a great segue into redesign. And just for my own personal story, you know, chili and cinnamon rolls were always my favorite, my, my most memorable moment, right? Chili and cinnamon rolls on Fridays in elementary school, that's a little bit probably much less academic than the, than those listed in the chat. Um, but I just think those memorable moments are what schools that are redesigning they're really trying to to aspire to set up for their for their students. So here's the schedule for today. Um, we have this morning from nine to ten thirty. We're going to do an overview of redesign. That'll mainly be from Tammy, Sarah, and I. Um, plus, and this is what we're very excited about, time for you as a new leader to connect with existing redesigned school leaders, to learn from them, to have kind of a mentoring session that we've got set up for you um, this morning. We're very excited about that. We'll take a break from 10.30 to 11. After that, we'll be on with Dr. Meckel talking about redesign leadership, specifically adaptive leadership or adaptive challenges versus technical challenges and how to lead through that. We'll then have lunch for an hour and then we'll come back after lunch, talk about culture, which is a big piece of the shifts we're seeing in school culture are, are really uh, significant that we're seeing in school redesign. So we'll have a culture discussion and then we'll have some questions that we've prepared for you to take back to have that discussion with your school redesign team, whether it's at the district level um, or whether it's at the building level, kind of those folks that have been involved in redesign, some questions you can take back with them if in fact you, you haven't had that conversation already. And hopefully we'll have some, some new questions for you to take back. Once we uh, conclude at 140, we're gonna break up into um, uh, groups and have those, those individual coaching sessions that that Tammy mentioned earlier, and there's a there's a sign up sheet for that, um, and so you'll have some one on one time with coaches that you signed up with uh, to 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 work through that. And those are 20 minute segments, so it's not 150 to 330 that you're meeting in that. Those are 20 minute segments that that will uh, according to the schedule on that sheet. So with that, we're going to jump into an overview of redesign, uh, kind of an orientation to redesign. And I wanted to take a little different slant this morning with this. Before we get into the what and how of Cans and Scan School Redesign, we wanted to review with you the major pieces put together by the State Board of Education five years ago that led to school redesign actually starting. I know many of you are familiar with this journey, but I think it's always important because it speaks to the why, why we're doing this in Kansas, why we're, we're jumping into school redesign. And since most of you, if not all of you, have been in education in the state during the last five years, instead of me just telling you the state board's vision, the profile of a successful graduate, and the state board outcomes, I'm giving you the opportunity to share what you know about those pieces. So uh, Sarah, if we could uh, move to the next slide, if you could grab your phone, or if you have a tablet available, Usually it works better if you're not using your computer, which you're viewing the, the Zoom from. But if you go to your phone, and Cody, this may be tough. I know I saw you in the car. Um, but go to menti.com and enter that code 2051 7173. 
And while you are doing that, I'm going to pull up the Minty poll. Okay, and Sarah, if you could allow me to share my screen. Thank you. We'll get into the poll. Okay. Um, Ryan from Emporia, could you give me a thumbs up if you can see this? Not yet. Okay, thanks, Ryan. Uh, now we're there. You see the nice moonshot, right? The Kansans can quiz, all right? So we just formed this up on the fly. Let's see how you do. Here's the first question. If I can get it to move. There we go. Okay, what is the Kansans can state vision for education? Is it? And I'm going to hide the results so we don't get some group think going. To lead the world in the success of all students, to lead the world in the success of each student, to lead the U.S. in the success of each student, or simply to beat Mizzou. And I see we've got around 34 people participating, so hopefully we can get, yeah, we've got 21, get those results in. Which one do you think is the state vision for education developed by the state board? So let's look at the results. I thought we might have this happen. So um, the to lead the world in the success of each student is actually the, the state board's vision. It was, some of you might be thinking, man, that's an unfair question. There's one word difference. To lead the world in the success of all students got the most votes. But the reason that we did that is that word each is very important because that speaks to personalizing learning for students, something that we really aspire to do in redesign. Yes, we wanna lead the world in the success of, of all students, but if we didn't use the word each, that may end up having us think about all students and in groups of students as opposed to each. It's the greatest challenge that we have uh, to lead the world in the success of each student, to personalize learning for each student. So that is our actual state vision uh, for education. Okay, let's see about the next one. So the next question is about the skills that the State Board of Education using the community, the Kansas Community Conversations, when Dr. Watson and Dr. Newman-Swanner went across the state and asked the question, what are the attributes of a successful young adult in Kansas? They, they condensed all that feedback into this profile of a, Kansas, of a successful Kansas high school graduate. All the things that Kansans told us they said are important for students to have as far as skills those were condensed into this profile of a successful high school graduate. The question is, which of these skill sets are part of the State Board of Education's successful Kansas high school graduate profile? Check all that apply. I, for one, since I have a high school freshman, would probably vote for driving to be involved in it. But at this point, let's see what you think. This is looking really good. So many dots, I can't even see the, the term. But yes, it's academic, definitely cognitive technical skills, employability, and civic engagement. You are spot on. Um, I know that some of you are thinking, yeah, our kids have really good debate skills, or they think they have really good debate skills, but that was not one that made the cut. But just so you know, 
it's very important that we talk about those five skill areas because that's the whole child. And before uh, the Kansas Can Community Conversations, we were really focused on academic achievement, but this is a, a, a look at all the areas that Kansas said students need to be successful in prepared for their life after high school. Way to go. All right, last one. So this, these are the state board outcomes. Um, these are the five state board outcomes that will drive us to reaching our vision. And so I'm just asking you all to identify those five from this list. And I forgot to hide the results, so go ahead and do the group think thing. Easiest quiz you've had probably in a long time, right? Kindergarten readiness, social emotional growth, individual plans of study, focused on high school graduation rates and post-secondary completion. Excellent, excellent, excellent. So those are the big major, the, the major pieces that the state board put in place based on the Kansas Can Community Conversations, which I wanna just, and I don't know if everybody has heard this, but Brad and Randy are back out on the road. So they just started yesterday. They, they're calling it the Kansans Can Success Tour. And basically it's to, to go back out and ask Kansans all across the state, are we on track with what you told us? It, are, do you still answer that question the same way? Are the attributes you identified five years ago still that, that important that we need to focus on that? So it's really reinvigorating and reinforcing and possibly help having us revise some of these big major pieces. But it, that's an important step to take. I know Randy and Brad are excited about it. They're stopping at 50 different locations in the next basically month. Um, and uh, I know that, that Lindsay Cravens who's on here today will be at, at that, uh, attending that session this afternoon. So we're excited for Lindsay to be doing that. We hope that, that you, can, you can stop and find, uh, find some time to, to uh, attend one of those sessions with Dr. Watson and Dr. Newenswander. We think you'll really enjoy it. And you all have bring a wealth of, of knowledge and experience to that conversation. So um, I'm gonna stop sharing. Well done, by the way. On the, on the quiz. And that's much better than me going through those. Um, you guys are all well-versed in that. So if we could go back to the slides, um, we'll jump into a little bit about redesign specifically um, and can give you a, a quick overview. And we wanted to start with this slide um, because innovation is a term that is often associated with redesign, but we don't often define it. And this was actually from an article that, that Tammy found from the Canopy Institute, or sorry, excuse me, the, the Canopy Project from the Christensen organization. I think it's linked in the, the notes section of the slide if you wanna take a look at it, but this is how they defined it. It's a process to solve a problem with a clear goal. So maybe a vision or goals, but no pre-existing path to reach it. And I think that, um, especially those on here that have been involved in redesign from the beginning would say that's especially true that they, they really, they, they came up with a vision, but there was really no pre-existing path to reach it. We now have somewhat of an existing path for redesign to go through. And that's what you go through when you, the process with the re, uh, redesign regional workshops. But what a great opportunity you have today to interact with leaders who pioneered the way forward in Kansas and redesign with no roadmap in hand. Um, you know, a lot of times innovation gets a bad name because it's not evidence-based and it may not be research-based, but that's the essence of redesign. We're trying to do something that's never been done before. So there, there aren't gonna be roadmaps laid out before you if, if you're following a process of innovation. Now that doesn't exclude evidence-based practices and redesign, uh, excuse me, research-based practices, but it just means that your mindset is more in line with discovering new things, new techniques, new learning experiences for your students. Um, the leaders you're gonna meet with today have learned a great deal about how to inspire an innovative mindset in their teachers to lead through incredibly difficult circumstances, not only leading through redesign, but then leading through redesign during a pandemic 
and all the while keeping a focus on creating more effective and engaging personalized learning experiences for kids. So that's just a little bit about innovation and how important it is to, to redesign. And it's, it's difficult. I think the, the school leaders on here would tell you this, you're definitely not choosing the path of least resistance. It's the exact opposite. But the effort and the difficulty involved ultimately are outweighed by the desire and the motivation to see students finding relevance in what they're learning, owning the outcomes, and ultimately finding success as a young adult. I think that, that outweighs it. So just a little bit about innovation before Sarah kicks us off into redesign. Great, thanks Jay. Good morning, everyone. So uh, we just wanted to kind of give you that high level overview of what is redesign. Um, so we're gonna dive more into those pieces as we move through the morning. Um, but if you ever get that question, well, what is it? Well, this slide can hopefully give you that elevator speech of what it is um, when we say redesign. So we know that in Kansas, our vision is to lead the world in the success of each student. And Jay talked with us about that word each. And we know that we're doing it because it's what Canton said they wanted. It's what that initial um, that initial tour, those community conversations said, we need to do things differently. And here are the things that we value. And so when we say that you're engaging in redesign, we're really saying that you're engaging in a process for looking at what's in front of you and coming up with a, with a system for addressing those unique educational challenges through innovation like Jay just defined. And it's more than just addressing something right now. It's about helping you create a process of continuous improvement, embedding within your culture, within your school, within your system, a way for moving forward and addressing challenges um, year after year with each new set of students that you have so that you can give them the quality educational experience that we all remember, those fun activities, those great unique learning things that we got to do that really stood out and made a difference in our education. We want all of our students to experience those things. And so as you're engaging in this process, we really say that redesign can be boiled down to three things. It's the principles, it's the process, and it's about establishing the right conditions. And so when you're thinking about redesign, think about those three things, the principles, the foundation, the process with, with which you operate, and the conditions that really set the stage for all of the success that you're going to have um, when engaging in this work. And so we have some resources hyperlinked on this slide. Um, we do have a really robust website um, that has videos from our schools. Many of our mentors um, who are with us today have have had um, teacher leaders submit videos. We also have a redesign Google site where you can gain um, information, some um, research articles, really quality examples of all three of these components in action. And then we have a, a Twitter that gets used really regularly to highlight success that we're seeing across our state. So those resources, again, are hyperlinked here on the slide. We won't go into them now, but we just wanted um, you to know that they exist um, and they're a great way for you to explore these things further. And so with that, I see Tammy put in the chat, please feel free to use it. We'd love to answer any of your questions. That's why we have this uh, training today is to make sure that you, you know um, all those ins and outs of redesign. So please feel free to put those questions in the chat. So at this time, we're gonna go through these three things in just a little bit more detail. So I'll start us off with the principles. So the principles are really those foundational elements, those things that we want to ensure are happening in our school, because we know that when we address all four of these things, we're going to meet the needs of each student, that we're really um, meeting the needs of the whole child. And so those four principles came from those community conversations. They said, we need more than just academics. We need those employability skills, those technical skills, that civic engagement piece. And so from that, these four principles came about. So the first being student success skills. We know that students need to have the social emotional learning capacities um, so that they can be productive um, in school and out of school, that they can have that perseverance, that grit, that determination to um, keep going when it's experiencing adversity. The second 
principal is family, business, and community partnerships. Uh, we know that our families, business, and communities now more than ever are an integral part of, of student learning. And we wanna make sure that we have mutually beneficial and reciprocal relationships, that the lines for communication and collaboration are open um, because we know that we're dependent on one another to make sure every child is successful. Personalizing learning is the third principle that we uh, build capacity around during redesign. And this definition is one that is a Kansas definition. We worked with um, a large group of stakeholders to um, synthesize across different educational and um, uh, resources and research to come up with this definition of personalizing learning means placing the whole child at the center. We have to have strong relationships and making sure that we're providing equity and choice. Sometimes you'll hear that as voice and choice when it comes to students um, being able to have a say in time, place, pace, path, and demonstration of learning. So that's what we mean when we say personalized learning. And the last principle is real world application, meaning that those things that students are doing, um, that it's transferable, that it mirrors something that they can see themselves doing in the real world, that it's not that math worksheet that we that we did in the 60 seconds where you had the 100 problems, right? Um, that's not as, as transferable unless you need that quick mental math as um, you know building an ecosystem or learning how to, to drive a vehicle safely. So that real world application piece is, that fourth principle. And you'll notice in the center, we have that cog because we know that in order to do one well, you'll need to build on those others. You can't provide students real world opportunities without having those strong community and business partnerships. We know that if students are gonna have a voice and choice in their learning, that that's gonna require some, some of those success skills in order for them to um, know how to manage their asks and manage their time so that they can complete those self-paced assignments. So those are our four redesign principles as schools are going through the process. We ask them to make sure that all four of these things are accounted for. But again, that cog in the center takes a little bit of that load off knowing that when you're doing one really well, you're more than likely addressing others in that process process. And so with that, I will turn it over to Jay to talk us through the process. Yeah, thanks, Sarah. So this, the, the, the process, and it's really, the, the more we think about it, um, it really falls in line with that def, definition of innovation. The process of redesign in Kansas is unique to Kansas. It's unique to school improvement. It's blending two models. Um, both are not unique to or are only used in education. They have wide application across the spectrum of industry. Um, and really design thinking had its roots in um, basically engineering and the four disciplines of execution, that's the 40X up there. I know that's a, a weird um, acronym, but uh, the four disciplines of execution, that is really has its roots in business improvement we felt like as we learned from the Mercury and the Gemini One schools, the first ones in, we've got several on here uh, with us today. Um, as we learned from them, we, we felt like bringing together design thinking and the four disciplines of execution was really the way to go. A very innovative school improvement process. And I'm not gonna roll through each of these steps and Sarah, you can feel free to just to, to uh, pull all those up, but as you think about it, think about if you were building a new home. I know that, that there's not a lot of home building going on right now, but if you just think about in the future, when you're building your dream home, um, you're gonna first want an architect, right? You're gonna want an architect who's going to listen to what you want in your home. They're gonna listen to, hey, how do I fit this 80 inch TV on this small wall that I've got, right? They're gonna listen to what you want in your home they're going to define your needs. They're going to brainstorm some design features uh, for, for you. They're going to, that architect's going to develop and draft some models. And then they're going to test them out by sharing them with you and saying, do you like this? Do you not like this? And so you need an architect. The architect is the design thinker, right? So they're using design thinking. So to, to, to get to a place that's something that's unique, uh, and if you think about it, everybody's redesign in their schools is unique. It's unique from David Brewer in, in Leavenworth 
to Emporia and how they're doing redesign as a district then in the buildings that's unique to you. There's no roadmap for this, but this process we found has been uh, motivating, enlightening for schools to, to actually become design thinkers and think about the student-centered experience uh, and keeping the students at the center of that thinking, uh, that design thinking. But if the architect just comes up with these great blueprints, right, for your dream home, they're just gonna sit there, right? If you don't have a construction manager, someone who's an expert in execution, right? So that's where the four disciplines of execution come in with the construction manager. That person is going to take the architect's plans and make it a reality. They're gonna narrow the focus down to the key goals. They're gonna make sure those goals are measurable and have a deadline, right? Construction managers are famous for that. And they're gonna utilize strategies to actually build the home. All the while doing that, they're monitoring progress, what we call keeping score, and holding teams accountable for progress, for the quality and for meeting deadlines. So your construction manager is critical to pulling all this together to execute. What we see a lot of times, uh, not a lot of times, but sometimes we see schools that come together with these great plans, they use design thinking really well, but then the execution piece really falls short um, or it's vice versa. So blending those two and really becoming experts in both is something that's it's really important to redesign and again, unique to Kansas. So with that, I'm gonna kick it over to Tammy. Thanks, Jay. So throughout all that we're trying to do, whether you're a redesign school or not a redesign school, culture matters. And so with, with redesign, we really focus on helping schools build and maintain the conditions for a learning culture. I'm just going to give you a broad overview because we're going to go into a little more depth later, but this um, graphic shows pretty much what our redesign school culture survey includes. And so you can see at the heart of building this culture um, is a shared vision for what you want learning to look like in your school. Um, there's this con the conditions of psychological safety for students and all of the adults in the building. There's really tight communication and feedback, and there's that growth mindset that permeates everything that um, every decision, every conversation is just permeated with this growth mindset. Um, principals have a role. We've said all along that redesign is teacher led. It is also administrator supported. So um, teachers are going to be um, leading this. They've been leading it. They're the ones closest to the students, um, but that doesn't leave principals off the hook. So you can see that within this culture, principals model learning leadership. They're responsible for motivating teachers and they're supporting inquiry, innovation, and exploration. Teachers are growing collective efficacy they become change agents. They are collegial and they have tight collaboration and practices. But then also there are external stakeholders who have input into goals and strategies and they communicate about and invest in redesign work. And the connector between all of it is this is the shared transformational leadership. Again, we'll talk more about it, but it's this culture that is doggedly focused on everyone learning together. So pulling all that together, uh, what Sarah outlined about redesign, that it's about the principles, the process, and the conditions, and those conditions are learned, our culture and shared leadership. We have developed what we call the redesign success rubric. And this was, we were inspired by the work done by many, many Kansas teachers last summer with competencies. Um, and so what we have developed for redesign, and this is a self-assessment tool for schools and redesign. Only if you want to share these results, would you ever need to share these results with your coach. But this is a self-assessment tool for, for schools and redesign. And the, 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 we've broken them down into six competencies. Those first four, one, two, three, and four are the four redesign principles. So you can, 
have everyone in your school go through on a rubric and rate where the, the level of competence in the school at that time for personalized learning, for real world application, for instance. We also have a rubric uh, or a competency for the iterative process. We took you through the blending of, of uh, design thinking and the four disciplines of execution. And then also we have a rubric and a competency for conditions that both the learning culture and the shared leadership, which Dr. Meckel is gonna take you through um, later this morning. So we don't need it. I think it is that document is linked in the notes pages. Uh, so feel free at any given time to take a look at that. We're not gonna take the time to go through that now, but this is a, the redesign success rubric is right, really a culmination of all the, the important com competencies in school redesign. And you can use this tool with your staff to really ascertain where are we in each of these areas. And so the last thing that we want to share with you before we let you get into some breakouts and start talking with your peers is just a really high level overview of the timeline. So in redesign, we work with schools intensely during a plan year. We uh, provide support during the launch year. And then we also offer support for schools in their ascent year. So um, year one being that design, they're creating their vision, establishing goals. Year two is really when they start to implement and collect some data, make adjustments. And then as they ascend, they're really modeling and mentoring others. And we have those individuals on here today. So they're continuing to make sure that the path that they've established for themselves is leading them to the success of each student. And so what's important for you to consider as you're reviewing this timeline is where in this process is the school or system you're walking into? So knowing where um, your school falls in this timeline will just um, help you assist them um, in continuing to engage uh, in that process of redesign and carry that work forward. So if you know that they're in that initial implementation, that's going to adjust how you work with that school uh, because you know that they're going to have to make some pivots, that they're going to have to examine that data. If you're coming into a school that's in um, those ascent years, um, then you might be encouraging them to start telling their story, to continue um, uh, growing, making sure that what they're doing is effective. Um, and so that's what this timeline should really help you determine is where is your school in this process? And so then how is that going to impact your support as you walk into the school or system this upcoming year and in future years? And so with that, I will turn it over to Tammy. Thanks, Sarah. So now we're going to get you into these breakout groups with a, a redesign mentor. I think that this is probably going to be the best part of your of this initial part, because I'm sure you've got questions and I'm sure you want to hear from these people who are really the boots on the ground. And so we're going to give you 30 minutes in your breakout. Please start with some introductions. Um, introduce yourselves. You're, you're all colleagues. You're, you're all kind of in the same, in the same boat with redesign. Um, these questions here are just a, to springboard your conversation. If your conversation takes a different direction, that's perfectly fine. Um, we want this time to be meaningful for you. But your mentor might start a, a bit with their own redesign story. Um, including why their school decided, um, how did they plan, how did those roles really play out, um, and talk about successes and challenges. And then you can already, you know, you can just do Q&A, um, what do you already know, what are you worried about, what are you hoping to accomplish. So again, this is just a springboard to get you started. Um, you've got 30 minutes in your breakout. And then when we come back, I am going to ask that each group share out either one thing that really resonated with them or one thing that they think the whole group probably needs to hear because um, maybe that particular tidbit of information wasn't shared in all of the groups. So Sarah, go ahead and break people into their breakout rooms and we will meet back here uh, at about 10 after 10.
Welcome back. We'll get started here in just a few seconds. I think, I think some of you timed out and hopefully it's so awkward when it just ends right when you're in the middle of, of talking, so. Yep, we should have everyone back. All right, well, welcome back everyone. I'm really curious to hear more about what you learned or something that stood out to you. Um, I'd love it if you would just volunteer to talk, but I'm not beyond calling on, on people. So I'll give you just a, a little bit and just jump right in if you'd like to share something, a takeaway or something you think everyone else in the group would like to hear. I can jump in and go first. Thanks, Jill. You bet. We had um, amazing conversations and there were some themes that emerged that I thought I might share. Uh, first, you know, with COVID and also with some turnover, it's, it's a time of change and transition. And so there's this opportunity that's presented for unity and how do we um, really focus in on the relationships and the culture and almost do a reboot, if you will. And there's this important theme that emerged about um, really celebrating and honoring the work that had been done in the past, um, while at the same time asking, you know, where are we now and where do we want to go? And, um, and to, to one of the challenges is just the time and, you know, how do we integrate this redesign work into other initiatives that may be happening? and just really make it feel less overwhelming and more doable, if you will. But great conversations from our group. Thanks, Jill. Um, that was room or, or group four, right? Who else would like to share? I can share. This is um, Janelle Rowland from group 10. And um, Stacy from Stockton was our mentor um, as us newbies coming in. And one thing that she said that really stuck with me and helped me to be mindful as we go in through this process is that um, it seems really overwhelming and it's a lot, but just thinking about the small steps that you have to take in order to get to your final goal, which was very like, okay, yes, we can do this just taking those small little steps and celebrating every little success, which I really, that helped bring my anxiety down just a little bit. <laughs> Definitely. Yeah. This, it, it, sometimes people make redesign out to be something big and it, it is, but it's not something that's done all at once or all in one day or even all in one year. So yeah, take, just keep moving forward. Thanks, Janelle. Let's see, uh, Jared Giffen from Emporia. Would you like to be the first person that I've called on? Well, sure, thanks for putting me on the spot. You are most welcome. <laughs> well, we were fortunate to be with Sheila from Newton. Uh, very similar districts, it sounds like, uh, in, in comparison. Uh, one thing that, that she mentioned that really stuck out, uh, a couple of things actually, was one, just uh, how to create the ownership in the process. I was in a training last week and they talked about compliance versus commitment. So it's just how do we encourage the leaders in our building to support the teachers if it's a teacher-led process? Um, you know, so that, that was a big takeaway for me is just really, and that's probably still a big question is from a central office standpoint, knowing it's a teacher-led process, how do we best support our leaders as they move their staff forward? Wonderful, thank you, Jared. Um, let's see, some of your groups are really small. So um, I'm gonna ask Rebecca. Rebecca from room one, what was one of your takeaways? Um, our, we had some really good conversation or discussion. Um, and I think my takeaway or my, the advice that I took away um, from Cody was really focus on those relationships um, so that it doesn't just die with the administrator. Um, you have to build that trust all the way along um, and being able to pay attention to the culture because once you go through redesign, it's kind of a shock to the culture. Um, 
maybe if you're already um you think you're bought in when you get in you know paying attention to it because the change and the teachers will or this community or the students will um, not know what they're getting into um, and with that always focusing on your why um, so constantly going back um, with staff and everybody as to why you're doing it and what what is your focus so those were kind of my tips that i took away from our our good discussion yeah so important to focus on those relationships and then go back to you know understand what was the why of the group that started you know when you're coming in new to the building um you know how how might you see that through through their eyes what what were they thinking when they got things started and certainly honoring the work that has happened before um let's hear from group six um i think carla or sheena one of you one of you be willing to jump in Hi, I'm Sheena Wyatt with Hutchison Public Schools, <clears throat> and our group was talking about kind of our process here in Hutchison, um, and we were sharing that it's been nice to have support with Katie through ESDAC, and just to be able to really watch our teachers and students and community to create this shared common vision and to really come together and see, you know, what's, what is it that those particular students at that school those teachers need um, at that particular time and to really um, envision that and then to really re refine, you know, what are some quick wins that we can, you know, change immediately or what are some areas that we really want to dive into? Maybe we want to look at, you know, grade banding or taking away even grade levels and focusing more on personalizing uh, learning, which is one of our, you know, KISA district um, goals. So it really trickles down to not only our district goals, but then um, allowing that same vision uh, for what our students and staff ultimately need. So we had some great conversations about just how our schools have been able to do that. And then we're also excited to have our middle schools start in that process um, to not just have elementary, but really a full pre-K-12 um, approach to change um, in education. Thank you. Yeah, Hutchinson is, is just on fire. We're really excited to be working more with your districts. Um, room eight, um, Brandy, Brandy Mitchell, what, did, what was your takeaway? Well, we were with Shauna Evans from Meadowlark Elementary, and I would say one of my biggest takeaways was um, her leader as a her role as a leader to really devote that time to research and um, create that time intentional time for teachers to have the opportunity both certified and classified um, to be involved and in, and really help to build that buy in. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Thanks, Brandy. Um, Lindsay, Lindsay from Stockton. Hi, so I talked to Kelly Whitaker from Ottawa High School and we um, visited about kind of ways to recalibrate everybody coming out of um, COVID affecting the process of some of this, um, kind of in the high school setting more so about keeping staff, um, I don't like to word, use the words bought in, but, but some in some way, I guess that's true how to kind of look at setting our goals again. Um, I want to increase graduation rate. And, you know, she talked about um, doing whatever it takes in collective e efficacy and how important that was to them at their school. And I got some good tips from her, but um, you know, some of her focus coming in as a principal are some of mine also now. So she was, very helpful. And I think we could have talked probably another hour or two about it. But anyway, thank you. Well, thanks, Lindsay. And you bring up a good point. I mean, your your mentor that um, volunteered to help today probably would be available to you in the future if you needed to, to talk more or continue this conversation. So please feel free to, to share that contact information sometime this morning. I think the only group I haven't heard from is room five. So Matt or JJ, what were your takeaways from your conversation? Yeah, one of the 
the big things that I took away from that was that, you know, we especially now need to be the voice of our school. Um, we need to be letting our community members, letting our, our stakeholders see what's happening in our schools, let them um, see the good things that are happening. Um, a lot of times in redesign, some of what gets out there is the negative side of things. And, and we need to just really be um, you know, celebrating the successes that are happening in our school and letting people know about those. Right, yeah, Once when your community, you're gonna to wanna to engage and see, what does your community really know about what's been going on? Um, is it something that the community has seen the effects of and are excited about it? Or has some of these redesign elements been kind of hidden from, um, from your public? And, you know, I don't know, you'll, you'll just have to kind of get in there and see that. Sarah was so kind to remind me that I did not hear from group two. So um, Katie or Kim or Craig from group two, what was your takeaway? Don't want you to feel left out. I'm gonna say that um, whether he intended to do it or not, I appreciated the fact that Craig gave us um, some of their more successful stories as well as things that weren't working as well for them. So that makes me a lot more comfortable with, you know, if it doesn't work, it doesn't work. Right. Right. Yeah. So as new leaders walking into um, existing redesign schools, you're going to have people with of wanting to get their voice in your ear, in your ear saying, this wasn't working. Let's stop. You know, they're going to be thinking, okay, we've got a new principal. We've got a new superintendent. Now, some of them are going to say, now we don't have to do this anymore. I just want to encourage you to listen to all of the voices. You know, don't be, don't, don't be taken in by a few naysayers that want to get in your ear early and often. I also, you know, heard, and I've been thinking about this too, in that the culture that you're going to walk into this fall, after all that COVID has brought our way, might be very different than the culture survey results that you have from the spring, right? Um, so I was just seeing a, a news flash where the CDC is changing some of their guidance and recommendations regarding masking. Um, there's still gonna be a lot of flex and require a lot of flexibility in how you open school and bring people back together. So focusing on building relationships as you're a brand new person in the school, get to know your staff, build that culture of psychological safety and collaboration, and then, you know, and then move out from, from that. So was there anybody who wanted to share that didn't get an opportunity to do so? I, I would just say that one thing that, that I really appreciated from talking with Matt and we're in very different communities um, you know, I'm over here in Olathe and he's way out West, but, um, hearing that we're talking about the same thing, which is, is really focusing on the why behind this right now. And I think this is a great time for that because you're coming off of the crazy year that we had last year. And so resetting that no matter what, what area you're in with redesign, whether you're like us and we're, you know, five years in, or if you're just starting, um, but then, uh, I really like the fact that we're doing this because um, to me redesign should not be dependent on on necessarily who the principal is and then we reset every time a new principal comes in um, so I think you know building up that community so that people can carry it forward when there is change in in leadership and that type of things are really really important and um, and then not just based on you know this this administrator that administrator and they have new goals and new vision and that type of thing so thank you for pulling this together Thanks, JJ. Anyone else want to share that didn't get a chance to? I love wait time, by the way. I like to watch people squirm, you know, and I don't know how much, how often you host things on Zoom. But um, I was reading where if you're asking a cold question that requires deep thought from the participants, 
you should give a full 90 seconds of wait time. 90 seconds. That little awkward pause was, as I was counting, less than 10 seconds. So, um, you know, I let you off the hook. Um, we're going to give you a chance to have a, a nice long break now. We're going to reconvene at 11 o'clock. Um, you know, feel free to get up, stretch, do some yoga, get a cup of coffee, check your email, do, do whatever you need to do. And then when we come back at 11, Dr. Doug Meckel is going to be talking with us um, really deeply about the culture required to really move change forward. Sarah or Jay, do you have any other announcements before we go to break? No, I just want to uh, continue to thank our mentors for giving their time this morning and really leading some robust conversations. We really appreciate that. And we'll be glad to have you in our next uh, set of breakouts after the break. So uh, thanks again. We'll see you at, see you at 11. Jay, you're muted. That's one for today. That's just one. Um, I generally allow myself at least three allowance each day. Thanks, Tammy. Hey, uh, welcome back. I'm glad you came back. Uh, we'd love to see you if you can if you can uh, show yourself on camera. I know some of you probably got in a 30 minute workout, so you're 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 sweating, huffing, and puffing. So I understand if you don't want to be on camera. My break was definitely not up to my, uh, what I wished. I was trying to get some steps in, but email just kept me at my desk. So hopefully you guys had a better break, uh, got some, got up, moved around a little bit, got your favorite drink and we're ready to go. So we're super excited uh, about this next uh, section. Um, and it's my privilege to introduce you, Dr. Doug Meckel. Uh, he works at, and this was mentioned before, but he works at uh, the Kansas Association of School Boards and also for our Regional Comprehensive Center um, that, that Kansas is a state in. And so um, Doug wears many hats, if you know him. Um, he's been part of our training at the regional workshops, the redesigned regional workshops for the last three years. We have definitely relied upon him as a coach, a mentor, a guide, um, he doesn't like me saying this, but our cheerleader um, for our redesign efforts, um, not only an ad, a strong advocate for redesign in Kansas, but a strong advocate for, for uh, just improving schools for the vision where we're headed as a state. Um, we're so lucky to have Doug on board with us, uh, partnering with us on this. Um, he's our resident expert on leading through adaptive challenges, specifically redesign. And that's what you're going to hear today. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Dr. Doug Meckel. Thanks, Doug. Well, good morning, everyone. Sarah, is it okay if I share my screen and use my, I, as always, I, I added a few, few slides as we work through this. It's interesting, when we started planning this session, um, we talked about what we could do. And, and I said, well, I would love to do a couple of hours. And as they turned out, they said, well, you have an hour. And I said an hour and Jay said, well, with you speaking, it'll seem like two hours for everyone. So, so I'm going to stretch my, I'm going to stretch my time and make sure we can work through this. A, a couple of insights for you. Uh, I want to make sure you understand that this, this redesign idea is wonderful. And, and right off the bat, Jay and Tammy said, it allows you to do something different. And, and that is so important as we try to meet the needs of all of our kids. The dilemma is doing something different oftentimes means we have to change. And change creates a lot of headaches 
for a lot of people involved in the process. And this redesign competency, Sarah will put this link to the actual rubric in, into the chat, but everybody involved within your sim system, your internal system plays a role in this. So it, Tammy said earlier, it, 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 we used to say it's led by teachers supported by principals. That is absolutely correct, but it has to be owned by everyone. Because if we don't all own this process, it, it's destined to have a, too many bumps and too many challenges, and it becomes discouraging. And, and I, think, I think you probably heard some of that from your mentors. So each of these, these components play a critical role. So the, the pilots and co-pilots, the people that lead that internal, internal public from, from within play a critical role in this. And they, they are the innovators. They're the early adopters that will make a difference. The principals play a role because they support it. And we'll spend some time today talking about the role they play related to specific leadership competencies and skills. The superintendent has to be engaged as well. And in some large districts, that's a challenge. In small districts where they're the principal and superintendent, that's also a challenge. So they have to be engaged. And then of course, your board of education has to be involved. And as I've told, I've told the redesign team countless times there's an election every two years and countless times the election can change the support for the process. So you're gonna to have to make sure you get them engaged and involved from the very beginning. I wanna quickly repeat one slide that they've already shared with you. Uh, this summer, they put this together and this is a, a fantastic Venn diagram that describes the process. If you ever have a chance, I hope they, I hope they can get the, uh, the rights to this, the, the, the ownership, because it is fantastic. Because these are the roles you play, you have to make them work. So I'm gonna to transition to the next slide. There are four functions of leadership. And these are the things that you'll be doing within your system and within your community. Are you focused on the right work? Are you inspiring people with a vision and a purpose? Do you develop culture and people? Okay, and how many times have we said culture today? The learning environment, the learning climate. And then do you define and drive success? Are you pushing forward? So those components evolve into these four key roles for leaders. Visionary, in which you inspire and move people forward and that moral purpose doing the right things for the right reason. Being a connector, encouraging, supportive, and collegial in, in culture, a director, setting the goals and driving performance, and of course, the learner. Now, don't think this is the role of just a principal. This is the role of this pilot, co-pilot, and the redesign team within your building, because you're going to hear feedback sooner than the principals do. Okay, you're, going to get a, you're going to get it in the faculty meeting following the faculty meeting about things we should have done differently or better. So you all play a critical role in this. But today I wanna to focus just on two of these four leadership roles. This aligns to everything you've heard to this point. One of the most important skills a new leader has to understand is you have to be a connector, okay? You have to be a connector and build relationships. So there's five key components and you'll have this on the slides when, you, when you're all done. But this cohesion and well-being, that is, are we working together and do we feel good about it? And they both, both Tammy and Jay and Sarah, to a degree, have alluded to this culture piece, or are we feeling good about who we are? Or is it a safe enough place to try, try some new ideas? Then there's interpersonal awareness, what's going on around us? Are you visible and present? Okay, do you communicate and accessible? That way people can get to you. And then do you make sure you provide affirmation for accomplishments? And if you do not provide encouragement when we make those, those quick victories, I think was the term we used earlier, if you don't provide that, then it becomes, it becomes less of a motivator and more of a just, just, oh, so what? Just another thing we did. The other component I wanna talk about, and you've alluded to this as well this morning, I think I heard some of the mentors refer to this. You have to keep learning. You have to be a learner. So how do we learn? Well, we, we, we maintain intellectual stimulation by reading, by experiencing, by professional development. 
We invite input from key decisions. We have people that we listen to and learn from. What do you think? Is this working? Is this a good idea? You have to align your resources. Okay, you have to stay focused on the right work. Do we optimize instructional time? Are we spending our time wisely with our kids? And then do we have knowledge of teaching? Do we know what good instruction looks like during the redesign process? So what I want to do is I want to let you reflect forward. You're moving into a new system or you're, re you're reinventing inventing your system. What are three challenges you will face in your new leadership role? So let's let's go in for let's go in for six or seven minutes, Sarah, and and we'll come back together when we're done. Everyone should be back. Okay, it's good to ha have everyone back. I hope you had a good conversation. Oftentimes reflecting on the challenges you foresee give you insights into how you're going to address them. Well, I wanted to take you from that without a report out because I know, I know that we have so many people it'd be hard to report out on every challenge. I wanted to give you a little more research. So when we talk about leading change or redesigning our system, it's going to have, it's going to be viewed two separate ways. And this is from the McCrell Balanced Leadership Work. Uh, and, and they talk about this in, in such a critical, critical way, but it's so simple to understand. So as you lead through a change, think of it as, as these four components. If it's first order, it's, it's everything that's on the left. So our redesign is really just the next logical step we're going to take, okay? The people you're going to be leading through this feel safe, they can see, they're inspired by the big picture. This, this is a great idea, I can't wait to move forward. Uh, the, the next thing is it aligns to what they feel good about as a group norms. This is who we are. You know, we're a progressive district. We're, we're always looking to do innovative things. It's going to be first order. And then of course, that last one, which is gonna be one of the biggest challenges of leadership is they know how to do it and they know they can do it. So anytime you're leading a change, if they understand, if you can make this a first order, next natural step, it's, the transition's going to be a lot easier. But what I will tell you, uh, the biggest change in your system probably will be you. You're going to be new, okay? You're either a new team leader or you're new to the staff, you're a new principal or a new superintendent. And then that moves things over to the right. And I, I always have to tell people, First and second order change isn't small change versus big change. It's my perception of the change. So somebody on your staff may view this change in a different way than you do. It's one of the challenges you'll have to work through. Okay, so it's second order if when we look at this change, it doesn't make sense. Why are we doing this? We've, we're doing just fine. We have a really good school and the kids are learning. Most of our kids are learning. Okay, why are we changing? Okay, if they don't see or feel that it inspires them, redesign is the next step. That doesn't seem like the next step to me. I, I, I'm not sure. I, I'm not sure I want to go there. I've been teaching this way for the last 25 years. I can't imagine wanting to do it, do it any different. If it doesn't align to who we are, if it disrupts our group norms or our culture, that is a big deal. And of course, the last one. Even if I think it's a great idea, if I don't know how to do it, if I don't have the skills or knowledge, then it may appear to be second order. And the reason I always point those two things out to you 
part of your job as leaders is to provide the skills and the knowledge to make the change happen. So I hope that's that simple thing makes sense to you. We'll come back to that in a little bit. Now, there's some real leadership components that are critical, and we'll go into a little bit more detail into those in a mentee, but these are the implications of second order change. These are four negative leadership responsibilities that get haunted when, when, when I perceive redesign as second order. So I'm gonna walk you through them quickly. Starting at the left, if we don't know what to do, it creates chaos. And it, it, we just lived through a year of chaos, right? I mean, pandemic creates chaos. What everyone wanted was order, okay? Read the paper, go to the board meetings and listen to what people are saying. They want order. They want it to be the way it used to be. So as a leader, you're gonna to have to clarify our routines and keep communicating our plan. Even if the plan means I don't know the next step, but these are some, some things we can do. Even that's better than, it, it, than chaos when, when you work through that. The next area is called input. So you're, if, if I don't feel like I have a voice in this process, if I'm one of the teachers that gets to, gets to complain in the back room about what we're doing, or I'm connected to somebody externally who complains to the school board about what we're doing, they're going to be really disillusioned. How do we make sure we give them input? So you must share the decision-making and explain the why. How many of you talked about that in your mentoring breakout rooms? This is why we're doing this. And these are the reasons we're going to make these decisions. The next one is communication. If our beliefs are challenged, okay, it's because we didn't communicate very well. I didn't find a way to frame the idea that the vision says each child. It says each student. It doesn't say some students. How do we frame our why and communicate it clearly? I, I love the term vision, but the vision that's not shared is just words on paper. Okay, you have to literally share your vision. So in your role as a leader is you have to engage in dialogue and help other people understand this bigger picture. The next area and the last area, and to me, this is probably the most critical one, is culture. If our group well-being diminishes, it's going to impact that learning climate that we keep referring to. And the culture surveys, the great thing about them is they showed that, that redesign really helped. But as a leader, you must communicate the new norms and you have to make sure that everyone understands the part they play, because that's where the change really, that's where the rubber hits the road for change. It's not the idea that I don't like change, it's how the change is going to impact me. That's where people struggle. So your job as a leader is to work them through that. So what I'm, I'm gonna switch to a Minty now, I'm gonna ask you a few questions, see if I can share this Minty slide. So I have a different code than Jay did, sorry about that. But the Minty code, and I'll give you a little bit of time, I, I'm gonna take Sarah's, I'm gonna take Tammy's advice and give you, well, less than 90 seconds, but I'm gonna give you some time to type in the code. 9513-1745, that's the Minty code. So I'm gonna ask you a couple of questions and let you reflect. And then we'll see how the group compares to each other. So my first, first question is first and second order. We just went through those. Tell me, based on what you know about redesign, is this first or second order change for your building or district? I'm trying to take into account teachers, principals, and superintendents who are in the meeting today. Will this change be viewed as first order or second order? So that code is 
Jay, I think you had about 25 people responding to yours. So I do not have those high expectations for my work. I'm guessing we're getting close. So this is a pretty important tell for us, pretty important tell for you, a pretty important tell for us as we lead redesign, okay? It, it wasn't all that big a deal, but it was well above the, the media. And we're gonna view this as a second order because it is something different, okay? We haven't done this before. It's inconsistent with our building norms and values. That's, that's gonna be a challenge. That's, a, that's an eye opener. We're gonna to have to find a way to work through that. Uh, it didn't work well with the staff's personal values. In other words, some teachers aren't gonna think this is a good idea. And the one that stood out the highest, I think is the critical one. How are we going to give them the skills they need to make this happen? Even if I like the idea, if I don't know how to do it, I, I've been using Canvas this year for the first time, it's second order for me. It's a great idea, it's a good program, but it's killing me because I don't have the skills to do it. So I wanna move you to the next question. What about the implications for first and second order change? Order, input, communications, and culture. I always refer to this acronym as CCOI, that's reverse, of course, from right to left and, and the acronym. But it, these are the critical skills you will need to be able to lead second order change, because these are the ones that are considered negatively according to negative according to the research. So I'm going to ask you another question. In your opinion, what will the staff's greatest challenge be related to the redesign effort? Will it be culture, communication, routine, order, or input? in your opinion. That is a great insight, good graphic. It's interesting, you can control input more than you can control the other three. It's hard to maintain order during chaos, but people like order, it's human nature. But it's interesting, it's hard to create a culture in which you may have some people that resist that and try to develop their own culture, right? Can you imagine that? Someone leading us astray or leading us in a different direction? Pretty good indicator right there. Communication, I would tell you the dilemma with communication, no matter how much you communicate, someone tells you you didn't communicate. They didn't hear you. I didn't know that. I hadn't heard that. When did we make that decision? So cohesion and culture are critical. So reflect on your skills of the things that you really do well. Rank your current skills related to the negative responsibilities. Which is the one that you will do the best and which one will you struggle with the most personally? This comes from the balanced leadership and there's actually 21 responsibilities, but these four are all aligned to the negative side of second order change. We're getting some results in. I have these hidden better. People always say, what don't you do well? I don't do any of these well, but actually my weakest, my personal weakness is communication. Okay, because I don't communicate very well. I think I do, but they don't seem to hear my thoughts. Let's see what, what we're thinking. Oh, interesting. So your skills 
are the opposite of mine. Very good. Good communicators, that's fantastic. Critical ingredient. We talked about shared vision, that's how you do it. Okay. Good insights, compare. The challenge will be culture, cohesion. Your strengths are communication, which will get you a long way down that path. Okay, I'm gonna stop that share. I'm gonna go back to my other screen. Hopefully, I'm gonna move you a little further along the way. Now, I told you there are 21. There are seven of them that are associated positively. This is the research. I'm not gonna spend all your time trying to, trying to cover balanced leadership in one day. It's a four day course. Jay and Tammy said I had an hour, so I'm, I'm working my way through that. But there are a couple of things that I do want to point out to you. That learning is critical, that visionary is important, being a connector, director, and, and, uh, and they all align. And those seven are the ones that really help with second order change. Those are the positive. Interestingly enough, here are the negative, and you notice where the negative, which corner they lie in? The connector. Leading change is about relationships. And I'm not sure who said that earlier in the, in the, in the breakout, in the Minty conversation, but they said it's about building relationships. And interestingly enough, the people who will struggle the most are the ones you have to build the strongest relationships with. Because the people who are already moving in the right direction, that, those, that's the easy group. But the ones that are gonna challenge you will be the ones you'll have to work with the, the, in the, and for the greatest length of time, okay? Now, we talked about adaptive versus technical. I would tell you this, when you walk through a problem, almost anything having to do with leading people can move to an adaptive challenge really quickly. But here are the definitions of technical versus adaptive. If you look at the technical side, if you're dealing with a problem, you have to, is, is it easy to identify? We know exactly what we need to do, okay? Does it have easy and quick solutions? Things that we've already done before. Does it require small changes that are easy for us to do? Are people receptive to this idea? Do they accept your solution? And are the solutions they can be implemented face and by authority? You can do this because I decided we need to do this. As the leader, we just need to do this. At, at, at 12 o'clock, we're gonna break for lunch. I can decide that, that's easy, okay? The adaptive challenge looks a little bit different. First of all, it's hard to define, whoops, I'm not sure exactly how I did that. It's, it's hard to define the problem. And that's the first step, is in an adaptive challenge is defining the problem. So is it difficult to identify? Does it require changes in the way we do things? We've never done this before. If we're going to make this happen, it's gonna be different. Does it require the changes, a lot of places in which we work across organizational boundaries. Will people resist the adaptive challenge? And then solutions emerge from our chance to work together to own this. But it takes time, it takes time to implement this. So here's a graphic that I want you to think through. In the center, it talks about the key ingredients. To, it requires, an adaptive challenge requires us to define who we are, our ideals and beliefs, okay? We have to define our purpose, our why, and we have to identify the root issues. Why do we want to get better? Well, because we're, 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 we have some students that, we, that we're not meeting their needs, okay? If it's a technical challenge, you can see the upper left, the solutions are applied, and top-down can generally do that. So you as the, as the leadership, as the principal or the pilot or co-pilot or superintendent, some of these decisions you can make because we're just plugging in technical solution. 
So it's directive. You can assign roles, set expectations, and then monitor and guide performance. To me, the, the easiest example that we've all lived through this past year was the vaccine. Okay, it's very technical in the sense that the scientists, okay, the pharmaceuticals had to design a vaccine. They had to find a way to get the vaccines available. And we didn't know if we would until December, okay? Once we've done that, we've done the technical solution. Here's the vaccine, Moderna, Pfizer, we have it, or Johnson, we have it all right here, right now. People can, people can get the vaccine and we can overcome COVID. The problem is it evolved to an adaptive problem. It became more complex than that. Adaptive challenge means the solutions are outside what we've ever done before. It requires learning and it requires bottom-up leadership. Everyone has to own it. So by doing that, you have to empower and share responsibility. You have to encourage dissent and innovation. We have to do something different. The technical solution to stopping COVID became adaptive when we found out, well, we had to get find a place to get all the all the the medicine all across the nation. We'd have to find a way to get nurses to, to provide the shots. Uh, we had to have facilities to do it. We did all that. What happened? Why didn't we get shots in people's arms? Because people viewed it in a different way. Some people didn't need it. Some people couldn't afford it. Some people didn't think it was necessary. And all of a sudden our technical solution became an adaptive challenge. And, and interestingly enough, terrible timing, but guess where we're headed back into the, getting ready to start this school year. Have you heard about masks yet in your district? Have you talked about coming back? The same thing that we went through last fall, we may be headed towards this fall. So I'm gonna let you go back to your mentee. Got a couple more mentee questions for you. Uh, gotta hit the right one. Technical versus adaptive. We just went through that list. Will your staff view your change initiative as technical or adaptive? And technical and adaptive is a blend of both. We know how to do it, but there's challenges to making it happen. That is excellent. That's a perfect blend because some of your people, there are solutions that you can lead them through and other challenges they're going to have to own. Your challenge will be, how do I define that? How do we define that problem? How do I know when it's technical and how do I know when it's adaptive? Will your staff be easily able to identify the challenge? To me, this, this is a great insight. You, you, you are on top of your game. This is the problem. What, what appears so obvious to some of us, right, is hidden to the other people. There are people that will not change because they see no reason to change. They don't understand why we should do this, or they're in a comfort zone. Now, one of the most powerful things in the world is called status quo, right? You know anybody who's comfortable in doing what they've always done? Have you met them? Are they in your building? How are we going to move forward when we're comfortable doing what we've always done? Okay, this is, this is the greatest challenge Dr. Watson has worked through as he's led redesign. There's a lot of people that can't imagine we should do anything different. Why? Okay, well, our school is great. Okay, we're doing great things. 
Yes, we are, but we can do better. We can get better. So how are you as a leader going to be able to identify or help your staff identify the challenge? Okay, Because if you can't do that, they're not going to change. That's a whole nother set. That's when I need that extra hour, Jay and Tammy. Yeah, that, now we're talking about Roger's work instead, instead of hypus. But you have to make sure they understand the advantage. There's a relative advantage to doing something better, to redesigning our system. If they can embrace that, then they can move forward. All right, I'm going to stop. Will your staff understand why we are changing? that purpose we talked about. One person, <laughs> that's, no, that's great. They will struggle with that. There's some people who can't imagine why we would change. I hope the other 19 that have reported out, their staff really does understand that. You, I, I am envious of you in that role. There we go. Now we have some, now we have another person who said, I'm not sure they will, okay? I work with Tammy and Sarah and Jay constantly, way too much, it almost kills them. But they would tell you that this is one of the challenges that the, they face in the field. There's people who don't understand why we are changing. Their comfort zone is so, so important to people. It seems like the change is second order. Okay, I'm gonna stop this share. I'm smiling because I'm, I'm feeling very confident that you guys are, are where we need to be. Now, here are some things I want you to remember. I'll see if I can get this to share. Here's some things I want you to remember about your role as a leader dealing with adaptive change. And it's interesting, almost everybody indicated that their change is gonna be both technical and adaptive. Okay, so I want you to think of these. The leadership behaviors that are required of you through this process is one, you're gonna to have to get on the balcony. You have to back away far enough that you can see the stage, not be on the stage, okay? You have to identify the challenge, if it's adaptive or not, because if you try to solve all the problems, when it's an adaptive problem, you will not solve it, okay? You'll just make it worse. So you have to identify that challenge. You have to regulate distress. People, when we talked about order earlier, people struggle when, there's, when, when it's confusing, when there's chaos, when there's the unknown. How are you gonna regulate stress and distress? If we push too hard, it gets very frustrating. If we don't push hard enough, we don't move through, we don't move forward. We settle back and do the things we've always done. So you're gonna have to regulate distress. You have to maintain attention on the work, okay? You have to push through this, even though it would be easier to settle back and do the things we used to done, used to, used to be doing. Give the work back to the people. You can't be the solution provider for an adaptive challenge. You have to be the person that supports them through the adaptive challenge. And then the last one is to protect the leadership voices from below. Okay, there's people who are going to be disillusioned, but their insight might be invaluable to you. Okay, it might be the key that, you let, that opens the door to some of the other people you're trying to lead. Now, notice on that left side, if it's technical and adaptive or adaptive, they treat the same behavior, leadership behaviors the same. If it's technical, you can fix it. But if it's not, we're going to have to involve everybody and make this work. Now, that last on the very far right where it talks about adaptive work, you have to put a, a holding environment together. I think Jay and Tammy and Sarah all mentioned right off the bat in the, in the, heart, of their, in the heart of their diagram, it says a safe working area, a safe zone in which people feel comfortable, okay, taking a chance. How many times have you heard safe enough to try? Okay, well, that's a critical ingredient for you to lead through this process. So the leaders and the followers have to interact. You can't, you can't go work on this problem 
on a Saturday morning by yourself and at the faculty meeting on Tuesday say, here's the solution. We have to own it. We have to all own this. And then I wanted to hit this other one for you because we've talked about culture all day. And I were, as, as, as some of you know, I work for school boards. A lot of my work is with school boards. What I remind every school board is that culture eats strategy for breakfast. Next week, when we bring in the new redesigned schools, we'll talk about this to the point where if, if you don't get your culture right, your change is destined to fail. And I, I mean that in a, in, a, in a positive way, not a negative way, because you have to get your, your culture right. And you do that by using these three steps. You have to alter, alter our behavior. Some of the things we've always done, we have to let go. We have to find a new way to do them. You have to challenge people's beliefs and their values. If I'm one of those teachers that says, you know, my kids are fine. Most of them are getting, most of them are getting C's or above, okay? If I measure through that model, then I'm not, I'm not ready to redesign until you can convince me that I need to reach all of my kids. It's about the learning, not my instruction. And then you have to force some changes from past processes. Some of the things that we've always done, that status quo, we're gonna to have to let it go. So I'm gonna send you to a breakout room. Okay, and we're gonna go for about seven minutes. I'm gonna discuss the importance of culture as it relates to your role as a leader. So Sarah, if we go for seven minutes, we'll have time to wrap up when they come back. On the challenge. Kelly, it's good to see you again. The redesign huddles. Looks like everybody's back. Okay, we're gonna wrap up here, but I wanted, I wanted to, to promote something that Jay and Tammy and Sarah started doing last winter. Uh, they did redesign huddles. And some of the, I, that's where I got to know some of these people. Uh, and so if they have a redesign huddle, when Jay sends that information out to you or Tammy this fall, I'm guessing, or Sarah, Sarah may send it, don't forget to sign up for that if that's something that they, they move forward because you don't have to listen to me, but you get to talk to each other and, and that's a great way to learn from each other. So what I wanted to find, find the final wrap up is this. I wanted to make sure you realize that you're embarking on the art and science of leadership. And this is how I usually begin, but today I wanted to end with this. There are leaders out there that we follow because we, we, they're charismatic, we love them, they're funny, they're, they're, they have all the right skills, but they have to understand the science of leadership. There's other leaders out there that really do understand the science very well, the technical side, but they don't understand the art. As, as a redesigned leader, be it pilot, co-pilot, principal, superintendent, uh, you're going to have to do both. You're going to have to learn both. You're going to have to, to be skilled at both if you're going to move forward. So if there's no final questions for me, okay, everyone likes to get, I, I do so many of these related to school boards. What I've learned is everyone likes to get done a little bit early. So are there any final questions for me before Jay, Sarah, and Tammy take over? Cody's shaking his head no. All right, we, we will see some of you later this afternoon when we break into small groups. Thanks for, thanks for spending an hour with me that felt like two hours, I appreciate that. Hey, okay. does anybody, I just gotta say this, does anybody get the feeling that Doug wanted more time today? I, I don't know if he mentioned it enough, but hey, the reason for that, Doug, is that for me to, actually orient to all the information you shared, I would have to stick with you 24 seven, but uh, this is an accelerated group, right? They get it. So you, you needed an hour, you nailed it and they got it. So thanks for, thanks for doing that. 
We'll see you in a little bit. Thanks. And before we break, I just wanted to give um, a big thank you to our mentors that gave their time this morning to be with us and facilitate our breakout. So if we could just give them a little uh, round of applause just to show our appreciation. We really um, do find your, your input and your expertise and just your commitment to this work really valuable. So thank you again for joining us. Um, we will come back at one o'clock um, to finish up our afternoon, and then we'll use that second half of the afternoon for our one-on-one -on -one coaching sessions. Um, for the afternoon, you will want your culture survey. Um, I sent those out last week. I've been responding to emails this morning. So if you can't find that, um, just send me an email and I'll get that to you this afternoon. Um, if you have a conflict this afternoon, um, just let your coach know and we can get those one-on-one uh, -on -one conversations rescheduled. But please enjoy your, your nice lunch. Um, uh, hopefully you can get outside and um, stretch your legs, move around. And um, if you need anything in this next hour, feel free to uh, send an email, put something in the chat, and we'll make sure you have what you need for the afternoon. But thanks, everyone. And, and just and get started. Um, this next little section, um, we're going to be talking a little bit more about school culture and your culture surveys. And then just um, some tips for you to take back to your school redesign teams, just key questions for you to kind of investigate to figure out where, where is your school and where is your school redesign team or building leadership team um, really at mentally um, and emotionally with, with redesign. So you've heard Dr. Meckel say earlier that we have to get the culture right. And um, I found this quote from John Gordon. He tweeted it this week. And it, it's really, this is really about organizational culture, not necessarily just school culture. But he says, culture isn't just one thing. It's everything. It's not just one person. It's everyone. Everyone on the team creates the culture. It's your culture. Own it. Make it great. And you know, one of the things, the key pieces of what we take schools through in redesign training is we teach schools how to build and maintain a positive culture that's focused on learning, where everyone is a learner. The adults are learners together. Students are learners together. Adults and students learn from each other. And um, unfortunately, um, we can't guarantee that you're gonna walk into your redesign school and have a completely amazing culture. Um, I hope it is, but it's something that grows slowly over time. And unfortunately, there are still leaders out there who believe that working intentionally on culture is just fluff. Um, they see it as another potluck or another faculty party. And while some of those activities might help build relationship, um, you could have a positive culture and not have it be a learning culture. So it has to be both. It has to be positive, it has to be relational, and you have to have everyone focused on learning. If you're still not convinced about culture, we have a couple of articles here, um, Cools et al. and Elmore et al. They, um, these two documents are um, academic documents and resources that we pulled this together with. And so you can look at that on your own if you're thinking we just made this up ourselves for redesign, we did not. Um, it's based on research. And in fact, the research says that schools with a positive learning culture provide safety, support, encouragement, and healthy challenges for staff and students. And this in turn fosters students' academic achievement and growth. Positive school cultures increase staff satisfaction, morale, and effectiveness while simultaneously increasing learning, fulfillment, and well being for students. Now, you might be thinking why in the world at the end of a, a COVID school year would we still have asked schools to? Uh, have their staff complete a culture survey? And that, that's a fair question, but the research shows that culture does not turn on a dime. Um, it doesn't get better fast and it doesn't deteriorate fast. And so what we're finding as we're looking across 
the um, culture surveys of multiple schools is that schools that went into the pandemic with a strong learning culture sustained that culture. And schools that <clears throat> had a pretty bumpy culture before the pandemic, um, it certainly was continued to be bumpy um, throughout the pandemic. So your school should have a copy of the culture survey they administered to the staff this past spring. And that is something as a new leader, it might give you some really good insights as to um, it, where, where staff is as far as that goes. Now, part of the culture survey, we'll, we'll look at a sample report here in just a minute, is the strong piece of teacher collective efficacy. And I don't know if you're familiar exactly of what teacher collective efficacy is, but it is really this strong belief that together as teachers, they can make a difference in improving student learning. And I will say that um, some of the early research from the pandemic shows that of all of these things with culture, while culture doesn't turn on a dime, teachers' collective efficacy took a hit last year. In other words, teachers might have felt like they could be rock stars in person in the classroom, um, but many of them just fell apart with remote learning. Or they might have felt really strong with in-person learning before because they had structures that were really collaborative and they got kids uh, talking together, but masks and social distancing made it super hard for them to feel like they were being effective educators. And so as you're going into this new school year and you're thinking about culture and building and sustaining a culture, um, just know that you might have teachers that feel like they suck at their job. Um, that's just some research from redesigned teachers across the state. Last year was really hard for them. And so you're gonna have to be a cheerleader. You're gonna have to be you know, part of the principal's job is to motivate teachers. Um, that motivation, that building them back up, helping them see that, that they really have grown tremendously throughout this past year is going to be a really big piece of setting the right foundation for the culture moving forward. Now, the reason we give a culture survey, we provide it to you, um, and we also collect some of this data, um, it's twofold. First of all, we want you to have a tool where you can just take the temperature of the culture. Once a year, you can kind of see where, where, it's, where the culture is, how it shifts. Um, we also have lo some longitudinal culture survey data. So if you're interested in seeing your school's culture survey data over time, let us know and we can probably pull some of that old data. And it's just, it's just a quick way for you to kind of gauge where, where is everyone at with culture? Where are some areas that you might need to strengthen? Um, and so what we do is we provide each individual school their own report. Now, we don't keep that individual data necessarily. You know, like I'm not that curious about each individual school's culture unless you want to talk about it with me. But what we also do is we are keeping longitudinal data on how the whole project, how it impacts school culture. And so we do have aggregate data for all of the schools in redesign who have taken this culture survey. So it's twofold. We want you to have that local data to use, but then we are also keeping track of that longitudinally across the program. So the culture survey is made up of, we can show it right here, and there are constructs. So there are different sections in the culture survey. And so those constructs are shared vision. And we'll look at some of those items here briefly. Um, are you building and sustaining a culture of inquiry, innovation, and exploration? Are teachers building their own collective efficacy? Do teachers feel psychologically safe in that they're not afraid to try or they know that they can learn from failure and failure isn't going to be held against them? 
Um, and then the role of the principal, do principals model that kind of learning leadership? What Sarah has pulled up here is um, a sample of, of the school culture survey. You should have your own, but just to kind of walk you through it. We have a little introduction as to how important the culture survey is. We also identify um, how many certified staff, how many classified staff from the school responded to the survey. We require that all certified staff have access to the survey and whether or not classified staff took it was up to the individual school. So if you have a, if you have a culture survey report that has no classified staff, um, that's not a problem. That's just the decision that was made before you got there. So if you just scroll down, you can just see um, the section on shared vision and it has eight specific questions. How did the school arrive at that shared vision? What does that shared vision focus on? And so, so there are about eight questions for the shared vision. There were eight different questions for the section of inquiry, innovation, and exploration. There's six questions on collective efficacy, I think six on psychological safety, and then eight questions on modeling learning leadership. So you can just see um, it's bar graphs. It's pretty easy to see where people are at on that. And so we hope that at the end of today, you'll take some time with your own building culture survey, take a look at the data, maybe talk with your pilot and co-pilot or teacher leaders, and then we'll show you some tools that you might use to either help strengthen certain areas or tools for how to share that report or even pieces of the report with your staff. Um, you might decide with your, your report, you might decide that you don't want to share the whole thing with your staff, and that's okay. And that should be a, a decision that your leadership team makes together. You might want to show just highlights, you know, things that are going well and maybe an area, area or two for um, additional work. Or you can feel free to share that entire report um, with all of your stakeholders if you so choose. So on the next slide, um, we provide some tools for you for improving your school culture. We have this uh, redesign culture toolkit and it aligns with the survey. So if there's a weak area on the survey, you can go straight to that area in the toolkit and look for additional resources, activities, discussion questions to help, um, help you talk about those areas that maybe you might want more support or more areas for growth. There are also, um, there's also an informational video linked to that slide. Um, you might want to watch that video before um, going through the toolkit. You know, one, one thing that could be a big mistake is if you address school culture in the wrong way, it's not going to build school culture. So um, we just have some some just little hints and warnings about how you might want to share this data and be positive and forward thinking using it. Um, the two main resources, the Cools um, et al. article from 2020, pretty recent. Um, the article is the school as a learning organization, the concept and its measurement. It came from the European Journal of Education. And um, you know, lo and behold, over in the United Kingdom, they are redesigning schools too. And even though we didn't know that when we started our redesign project in Kansas, they're very similar, extremely similar. So that might be a really interesting article for you. And then also Elmore Foreman and Stotch um, from Harvard also have an inter internal coherence assessment protocol. This is a really deep, a long survey. Um, we chose not to use it, but we did pull some items from it. But if you ever wanted a deeper dive into school culture, that would be a great resource for you. And then I, being the nerd that I am, I pulled all of the resources that I have on culture and climate. Um, if you wanted a more complete bibliography or more choices for, you know, how to build and sustain school culture, 
or if you just wanted to write a research paper on culture, your bibliography is done. It's right there. So if you wanted some other additional ideas, I wanted to sink that in too. So again, um, remember starting this year, you're going to want to build relationships and focus on culture. Maybe even before you get a handle on what specific redesign strategies your school is trying to implement, um, you know, start with those relationships and that culture um, right off the bat. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to Jay for uh, fact finding. Yeah, well, thanks, Tammy. And what a wonderful, you know, shallow dive really into culture. Um, but what a wonderful resource that that has been developed. And Tammy's just done amazing. And Sarah have done amazing work with, with culture. Um, to help with that, we also felt like as part of this training, as you go back and uh, some of you may have already had some preliminary conversations with your SRTs. Now, just as a reminder, um, you know, we like acronyms in, in education. That's the school redesign team. SRT is school redesign team. You may have already had some conversations with the SRT, but if not, or uh, if you want to extend those conversations and, and do a little bit more fact finding, we came up with some questions that we think will help. Um, as you come into a new situation, acknowledging and valuing the work that has been done before is critical. I think both Jill Lackenmeyer mentioned it this morning in the breakout, how it's really important to acknowledge and, and value the work that's been done before in redesign. Because if you're walking into, if you're walking to a new situation and you're not familiar with it, you have schools that have really lived uh, in most cases, I would say in all cases, a bumpy ride in redesign. Again, it's the path uh, least taken. And so I think it's really important uh, and a quick win for you as a new leader to acknowledge and, and express your, the value that that work has in moving forward, affirm that work. You know, Doug also talked about being a connector. And part of being a connector is affirming the work that's already taken place. So I think when you start with questions, and I know you all have great ideas and you, you wanna see those ideas come to fruition at some point, but if you start with questions for your SRT, I think that will be that will send a clear message that we value the work that you've done. I wanna hear all about it. Um, and, and so as we move forward, so these questions um, we, we pulled together and these could be asked of the entire SRT or as an individual but why do you want to change? Why do you personally want to change? And then why did your school want to change or redesign? Now, I know you heard that from your mentors today. Some of you may have heard that. I think the why, we've said that multiple times, the why is so important. You know, I know Cody Calkins said, keep coming back to your why. And that's very, very important. So if they can't express why, that's a red flag. Um, what exists? So currently, what's the current state of redesign in our school? Where's the vision at? Is there a vision statement? Is it clear, concise, and is it compelling? If, uh, if it is there, does it need revision? Does it need to be revised? Do we need to go out and talk to people again about where we want to, where we want to go as far as our moonshot? Are there goals in place? Um, if they are, are they measurable? Do they have a timestamp to them? Is there a way to monitor progress on those goals? Sometimes we have goals that, that are like, they're broad categories, you know, like social emotional learning. Well, that's fine. And that, that may be a, an area of need, but how are you going to measure that? What's the target area? So with, when we say targets, if you have a goal area of social emotional learning, what's the target area? Is it persistence? Is it flexibility? Is it integrity? What are the social emotional skills your students in your school are struggling or at the district level are struggling with the most? So though it's narrowing down to those targets and then you have the strategies that leverage those goals. And I know it was mentioned earlier that you may be, um, you may be walking into uh, just kind of a you know, an unknown spot as far as strategy, because a lot of us. That's me. <laughs> it's okay. A lot of the strategies that may have been in place in redesign before the pandemic may have been undone to a certain extent. 
and replaced with other strategies, but that's okay. We, we talk all the time in redesign, it's not about the strategies. Doug mentioned this, Tammy mentioned it, it's about the culture. What kind of culture, teaching and learning culture exists? And if it's innovative, then no one is wed to a strategy. Strategies can change over and over. At times, we had some fairly comical conversations with, with redesign teams this past year where they kind of sheepishly said, yeah, we were doing this strategy for redesign, but we changed it due to the pandemic. And then they looked at us like we were going to react in some way. And we did react. We were like, congratulations, that's the way to go. You know, don't be wed to these strategies, but you definitely want to get a feel for what strategies are in place. Are there public scoreboards for those strategies? Are they where they everybody can see those public scoreboards determine and, and those scoreboards show the effectiveness of the strategies? Um, so do those exist? Um, accountability routines and necessary support. How often does the SRT meet? How often does the whole staff meet on the scoreboards and talk through how effective the strategies are going? So you wanna kind of get a feel for all those different current state uh, pieces, the current state of those pieces of redesign. Uh, a bigger question is, what is your desired future state for this work? What do you see as the as the panacea, right? Um, the, where we want to go as a school, what do you see that? Um, can you paint me a picture of that? What gaps exist and what, and what those gaps that need intentional support, what are those gaps, right? And how can I help in, help in overcoming those and closing those gaps? You can also pull out, and th this, the redesign success rubric, I mentioned it earlier this morning, we rolled it out in January. So it's probably not a um, well-used or well-known tool yet, but that would be a great place to start if your SRT and your staff are ready to go in and kind of rate themselves on those six competencies and redesign and, and do that at the beginning of the year uh, or when a time you feel is appropriate to jump in and look at where are we on these, on these six competencies for the redesign success rubric. And then a really important question, and this came from, I think, talking with people who were new to redesign schools before we had this training. This is the first time we've done this training, right? So before we, we would meet with, maybe individually meet with new leaders to redesign. And this was one question they always had, always had. What role did my predecessor play in redesign? So Angela at Dighton, what role did the superintendent play in redesign at Dighton, right? Uh, the principal that you're that you're replacing. What role did they play in redesign? You know, we talked about it. it's teacher led, administrator supported, but as Doug said, owned by all stakeholders. It's important to get a feel for what role they played in redesign before. And then a more important question is to the SRT: What do you need from me? What role do you see that I need to play um, as we move forward in redesign. So those are just some questions that you can have, take back with you and use um, as you start fact finding with, with redesign, with your school redesign team and staff. So the next couple of slides are some seminal documents, resources that, um, that we've developed over time. And I don't know if many of you know me, but I kind of like colors. Sarah knows this about me. Um, so I apologize if this is too busy of a slide with a bunch of colors on there. But the reason we put this together was in response to buildings saying, how does our redesign work connect to the district's vision and goals? How does our building redesign work connect to the state level vision and goals? And so when we first started this, we had a one pager just for the school redesign, just for that building. We have since grown that because of that question. We get a lot, how, do, how does the work we're doing at the building align to the district and the state? So this is, a, um, this is a document that you can work through with your SRT. And starting at the top, obviously that's the state's vision. You all, uh, some of you got that right this morning. But we're close. Um, but that's the that's the state vision, and then those are the five outcomes you all identified. 
And then it gets into the system or district, right? District or system, those are synonymous terms. What is the system's vision? This is an important piece. We, we worked with some schools early on that the building had a real motivation to jump into redesign, but maybe that motivation was not shared at the district level. And so we had some buildings that were really flying far and got ahead of the district. Right? And they didn't have, they'd had their, they had their collective vision within the building, but they had no district vision to tie to. So we feel like this is an important document What's the vision of the system of the district? What is that system or district value? And then the goals are your KISA goals, right? The KISA goals are, 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 there's a place for those to be listed. You know, after this year, those are the goal areas. Uh, we're, we're gonna make some adjustments to that, but right now those goal areas, those four goal areas are still in play. So you list those under KISA goal area. And then the lag measure, this is a very important piece, is how you're measuring that goal area. How is the district measuring relationships if that's a KISA goal area? How are they doing that? Or how, are, how, how is the district doing that? So if you've got responsive culture as a KISA goal area, there has to be a way to measure that, right? And we always talk in terms of from X to Y by when. And I, I should write that out, but from X to Y by when, X is your current state, Y is your desired state, by when, and by when is your timestamp. Hey Jay, there's a question, there a question? in the chat. Yep. Sure. So the chat says, would you clarify the difference between vision and mission? Yeah, that's a that comes up quite a bit. Mission, and this, you know, this is from my mind and how we've kind of talked in terms and redesigned mission and vision. Mission is why you open your doors every day. It's what your, what your purpose is in being a, a school where kids can come and, and learn and grow. It's your mission. It's the, it's the work that you do every day. Vision is where you want to go. It's your moonshot. It's where you want to be in, well into the future. Okay, so I think in terms of mission, and somebody jump in and clarify, um, if you feel differently, but I think in terms of mission is that's your daily purpose uh, as a school in teaching and learning. And then that vision is where we want to be. Um, and if you look at that vision statement for the state, Kansas leads the world in the success of each student. That's definitely a vision statement. And it's definitely, it can be measured, right? Um, and that's a future state thing. Okay. So I hope that helped clarify the difference between mission and vision. Um, so as we move down, um, the school vision section, that would be where the school building would actually de uh, develop their vision and, and put their vision statement. Um, and then you have the foundational four redesign principles. And then underneath those are the goal areas for your building and redesign. Now, we always coach that two to four goal areas is the, the sweet spot. If you are under two, obviously that's not a, you're not going to be addressing all the areas of need that you see in your students. But if you get over four, then none of those goals are really wildly important because you just simply don't have the capacity, resources, time and energy and effort to focus on more than four goal areas. And then that's, that's got some research behind it. Um, and we, we base that off the, the, the four disciplines of execution. But when we say goal areas, we don't mean you just take the principles like student success skills and you plug them in as a goal area. Those are principles, right? Those are what you redesign around. The goal areas are what areas do your students need the most improvement as far as student performance? Do they need improvement in social emotional skills? Do they need improvement in academic skills, employability skills, technical skills? I mean, what are those skill areas that students really need to grow in in your school? And those, again, are unique to your school. And then how are we going to measure that? So if it is social emotional learning, how are we going to measure um, the growth in our students for that goal area? And then underneath that, you have the strategies. Um, but as part, part of a process, you start with the vision, you move to goal areas, 
how you're going to measure that, and then you move into strategies and through that. So we see this one pager um, as a very important document to tie everything together. The next document is a gap analysis, and I'm not going to spend much time on this one at all. I think it's pretty self-explanatory, but a gap analysis, and, and this is holistically of your redesign. So this might help you as you, as you talk through with your uh, school redesign team, where are we presently at a high level with redesign, right? What levels of support do we have? Um, where are we with vision, goals, all those things? Your present state, that's your present state. Then you identify gaps, challenges, and then you articulate uh, the future state. So th this is a document that, that schools have told us has been very effective in helping them kind of take some of these abstract concepts and pull them into something that's, that's uh, tangible and, and can help you move forward. So that's just a couple of documents we wanted to share with you for you to take back and use at your leisure um, in redesign. And with that, I think I will kick it back to Sarah. Thanks, Jay. Um, so as you begin this, the school year and continue this important work that's happening in your buildings and your system. Um, we just want you to know that you're not alone in doing this. Um, we are we are here to support you, but you also have your um, your educational service centers um, and those representatives as well that have been conducting our regional trainings alongside us, working with us closely these last few years. Um, and so they will be a great resource for you in sustaining and continuing that work. And so we just want to make sure that you have their contact information. So um, the contacts on this, uh, slide are not the only people at those service centers that can help you. Those are just the individuals that have been uh, partnering with us to facilitate the redesign regional trainings to do that redesign coaching. And so these would be great uh, assets for you and your team as you look forward to this year and look to continue that great work. So we just wanted to make sure that you knew who those individuals were uh, and that you had their contact information. We also want you to know that as you're continuing that work this year, there are opportunities for you and your team to continue to engage in learning and conversation around redesign. So for our schools that are in that launch and ascent time, we offer uh, once a month PLCs. Um, I apologize for saying once a month. This upcoming year, we're going to offer the same thing twice. Um, so you would only need to attend one. Um, but the first Tuesday, Wednesday of each month, we'll be hosting a one hour PLC uh, via Zoom just for you, your SRT, to continue those conversations around topics related to and relevant in, in redesign. So our theme for this upcoming year is engagement. So the fall semester, we're going to focus on building engagement through relationships. And second semester, we're going to focus on building engagement um, so that you can increase um, student learning and really create engaging learning environments and facilitate the development of that learning culture. So this opportunity is available to all of our schools, and so we would encourage you to make sure um, that someone from your school is, is attending one of those two days. We also record these, and I know last year we had schools that couldn't make that time work, but they would use that recording in other um, professional development time that they had with staff. Um, another thing that you might consider looking into as a way to support your work moving forward would be engaging with us on our redesign Twitter. Um, and then I also linked in again the Google site that has um, just a plethora of resources around those three important elements of redesign, the principles, the process, and the conditions, um, as well as our redesign webpage on the KSDE site. So all of those links are here for you. Again, just another way that you can engage and learn um, about redesign at your convenience. And then we would also encourage you to make sure that you are on our listserv. So we send out a monthly newsletter. We also make sure that our school leaders um, and school redesign team members are aware of other opportunities related to the agency, such as the conference or providing um, 
uh, the opportunity to engage in those kinds of success tour that's happening right now. So we use our listserv to send out um, notices, information, tips, um, great articles that we found. Uh, we try not to, to overuse our listserv so that you ignore it. We've, we've tried to hit that sweet spot of how many messages we send per month. But we would encourage you and your teams to join that listserv. You can email our administrative assistant, Pat Bone. Just make sure she knows your name, um, what school and district you're from, and the redesign cohort. Uh, sometimes we'll send out messages um, to, to specific cohorts, just knowing that they all are kind of in a different place and redesign. Um, so just let us know what cohort your school is in, um, and we can make sure that you get in the right list. And if you're not sure, uh, you can just send that in the email and we'll make sure you get on the correct list. Before we kind of wrap up this whole group time, we would really appreciate your feedback on um, today's session. Um, I'll go ahead and put that link in the chat. It's just three questions, so hopefully it only takes you about five minutes, but we ask that you do that um, before signing off for today. Um, Again, we just want to make sure that the support that we're providing you is, is timely and relevant and meaningful and making a difference. So um, if you would please provide us that feedback um, and then we will let you go so that we can launch our one-on-one uh, -on -one coaching sessions. So with that, here is all of our, our contact information. Um, if you need to get a hold of us, you can email us individually or you can email all of us at redesign at ksde.org. So all of our contact information is there. We would ask that uh, over the course of the next five minutes, please take time to do that survey. And then if you need to um, be reminded of who you are working with as a as a one-on-one uh, -on -one check in this afternoon, feel free to put that in the chat um, or you can always unmute and ask. But with that, I'll stop sharing and see if we have any uh, final questions or comments. Well, thanks everyone for participating. Um, appreciate your feedback. Um, it's going to be a great year. I'm really excited for all of you and um, I'll see you later this afternoon on a coaching conversation. Yeah, so Tammy, just, be, 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 before, before we, we sign, sign off. off. Oh, I hear you in echo stereo. Just to clarify, um, we go to our individual coaching sessions and then um, you have just follow that timesheet and we just sign into that individual Zoom. Yes, I since I each of us sent invitations via um, Outlook calendar and the link is embedded and it's just your time to ask whatever questions you want with one of us, Jay, Sarah, I, Doug, I think Jennifer and Katie are going to be part of that as well. So it's just a time for you to ask whatever you need to ask. Yeah, good clarifying question there. And thanks so much for attending our first ever new leader boot camp. We really appreciate your um, your your attendance today, your um, attention, uh, diving in with some mentors, with Doug, with our service center folks. Uh, we just appreciate you being part of this. And we're really, really super excited for you for this year. And we're here to support you. So please let us know how we can do that. And again, thanks for thanks for attending today. Thanks, everyone. Hopefully we'll see you in our one-on-ones.